Hi, my name is Valentine Andraker, and I am part of the Cyber Infrastructure Architecture team. And welcome to the Introduction to Python course. So as part of the objectives for this course, we're going to be talking about uh, what Python programming is, why learn Python, the Python syntax, strings and console output, conditionals and control flow, functions, lists and dictionaries, loops, file inputs and outputs, and finally, Python Anaconda. So what is Python programming? Basically, Python is a general purpose programming language, which is another way to say that it can be used for nearly everything. But the main goal of an object-oriented language is to make code reusable. And we do this through the use of classes and objects. So Python is an interpreted language, which means that the written code is not actually translated to computer-readable format at one time. So this type of language is also referred to as a scripting language, just like um, JavaScript, you know, you use for the web. But what you need to take away from this section is that Python is a programming language that is used to develop software on the web, in an app form, and on the mobile platform. So some of you might be asking, why do you need to, to learn Python? Well, Python is easy to read. The readability reduces the maintenance costs and increases programmers' productivity. Now, Python has a massive community in the sense that most companies and open source communities use Python heavily, and you have the advantage of getting help easily anytime you need it. Python is heavily used in STEM fields as well because it has a ton, you know, a ton of most popular data science libraries. Python is cross-platform. It runs on Linux operating systems, Windows operating systems, and also Python is free. So in this section, we'll take a look at uh, Python syntax, um, the print statements, comments and doc strings, variables, data types, and arithmetic. So most of the time, um, we want to write, you know, like a message to the console. There are two ways of doing this. So here we have Python version two, and the way you want to print a statement to the console is by using the print statement, a space, and a double quoted string. And for Python version three, you use print statement and your double quoted string within a parenthesis. But currently, Python two has reached end of life on January 2020. So this means that it's no longer supported and its libraries are not compatible with Python version three. So we stick to this, Python version three. So most of the time when your program or your code base becomes bigger, it becomes more complicated and difficult to read and maintain. Now for these reasons, it's always a good practice to put some documentations or notes into your code. These notes are known as comments. Now comments begin with a hash or pound sign followed by a space and then the comment. So block comments, you know, are used to explain the code that follows it and the code being explained should be on the next line after the comments. Now inline comments like this are placed on the same line just as the statement. So we have, um, we also have what we call doc strings. Now the difference between a doc string and a comment is that a comment helps the developer understand the function of different sections of his or her code when it is revisited at a later time. For example, if I take a look at this code, you know, five years from now, what does it actually do, right? So doc strings, provides detailed description about a given function, class, or module. Now the description is returned by Python when you run the help command. And we're gonna take a look at that in a little bit. So I'm gonna open up my um, VS code and by the side I have my terminal running. And then um, I'm gonna open up insertion sort of py so basically this is a 
a sort algorithm that sorts um, the contents of an array in ascending order. So this is my array content and I'm passing it as a parameter into the insertion sort function. So here is a doc string. This is what a doc string looks like. So you have the triple coded string and then you have the description of this function. So I'm just gonna go, go ahead to um, execute this code. Return. And then the name of my file in session sub.py. So this is just to make sure that the code works. So next I'm gonna go into the Python console and then I'll have to import my file without without the .py extension. Now after this, I'm gonna run the help method, the inbuilt help method of Python, and then I'm gonna call the name of the file and the name of the function that I would like to view its detail. There you go. So here it gives you a description about the function. So most programmers implement this to their code just, just to make sure that all the people who are trying to use these functions understand the real essence of utilizing that function. So basically, doc strings are also known as Python documentation strings. They are string literals that are put as the first statement in a method, function, module, or class definitions. So next we'll talk about variables. So whenever, pro whenever you're programming in general, we need to build systems for dealing with data that changes over time. The only important thing is that it may be different at different times. So Python uses variables to define things that are subject to change. For example, we have the welcome message, which is equal to a double coded string, welcome to Python workshop. And then over here, we have um, a variable room number, which is equal to a numeric value. Or as you can see, both of these variables have different data types. And how does Python actually distinguish between um, the types of data? So basically Python uses dynamic typing, which is more flexible, but allows for variables to change types. So type checking is always on the fly during um, execution of the program. So it doesn't really know about a type of variable until the code is run. Now let's take a look at an example. Oh, sorry. Oh, so I looked at the wrong one. So this is what we're looking at. So I have a variable and I set it to, um, and I set its value to welcome the Python workshop. And then we're just gonna go ahead to print this statement. So I'll use my Python command and then the name of the file, which is welcome.py. So as you can see, we successfully printed this message to the console using a Python version three print method. We can also declare a room number can also declare a room number and print its value. So let me duplicate this uh, room number. And let me try to execute this code again. There you go. We have a room number 126. So talking about data types, Python also has um, different data types, such as strings, numbers, and booleans. For numbers, you can, you can assign float values, which are known as decimals, integer values, which are just um, a single numerical value. And then we, have, we can assign booleans as well, which is either true or false, and then strings. We can also perform arithmetic um, operations which are very easy to do using Python. So let's take a look at strings on console output. 
So over here we have um, we have a basic uh, string um, string assignment. We have a variable called my name, and I assign uh, my name as a value to this variable. And then I also have my age, just like the example we looked at previously. <clears throat> and then we have string methods. These string methods are in the Python methods. You could use it to manipulate um, the, the contents of a variable. And we'll take a look at an example right away. So print my name dot upper changes my name to uppercase words. And then the print learn my name gives the total length of my name. And also, we would also use um, the string formatting to display the, the contents of mixed data types, such as strings and numerical values. Let's take a look at an example to see how this works. So I'll go back to my basic.py. Over here, I've declared uh, my name variable and my age. And then this is just going to give me an uppercase uh, transformation of my name. And then this is just going to print out the length of this name. And then because I want to display a string and an integer value, I would have to use the string formatting, which this section means. Um, I'm going to print out a string value. And this D, percent D, means I'm going to print out a numerical value and then this this right here is a place where I would have to enter the, the variables that I that I intend to print respectively. Let's try to execute this code to see what we get. So I'm gonna run the Python command and then the name of my script. Yeah so as you can see my name has been transferred from to an uppercase word, and then the total um, number of characters is equal to nine. And then here I'm printing my name and the age. So let's talk about conditionals and control flow. You know, just like in real life, sometimes we'd like our code to be able to make decisions. This gives us the ability to choose among outcomes based on other things that may be happening in the program. So over here we have um, in Python, you could also um, utilize comparators just like you have in other programming languages. So this describes less than, greater than, double equal sign and not equal to. We also make use of Boolean operators such as true or false. Um, here we're focusing on the or statement, and then we have the and for comparing two different uh, two different uh, statements, and then we have the and not for comparing two different statements as well. So this is what an if statement, conditional statement, looks like using Python, where you have the if keyword, the the, the condition, and then you end it with a colon. Next, you have your statement, and then you have the L if, the condition, and the colon, your statement, else, and then your statement. So let's take a look at a quick example of the if statement. All right, so this is a simple script that checks if five is greater than six. If it is, it prints this statement here, right here. Else, if five is equal to equal to six, then it prints this. Otherwise, it just prints this and says the above conditions are not met. So let's go ahead and execute this code. I'm gonna clear my console and then Python conditions the py. Yeah, so just as expected, the result is none of the above because these conditions specified here aren't met. In this section, we'll talk about function definition, parameters and arguments, imports, and built-in functions. So a function basically is a reusable section of code that is written to perform a specific task in the program. 
So there are cases where we find ourselves repeating certain codes and this can frustrate and clutter your program. So the best thing you want to do is to utilize a function. So let's say you have a code that prints um, the name, the gender and hair color of um, a given individual at different sections of your code. This actually clutters your code. And the best thing you want to do is to define a function um, to always call um, that section of your code. So here we've defined um, a function. And here we have a comment that tells us, you know, that describes the function. And then we have, you know, a doc, doc string that, you know, tells us the detail, what, what is being performed by this function, the actual, you know, the detailed description of this function. And then we have um, our, our code, our print statement. And over here, we have to call our function because once, once you declare your function, you need to call it in order for you to see the result. So this is a function declaration and this is a function call. So just to give, an, um, just to give a brief example, we'll go to the function.py file just the same thing we had. Um, we've declared our function, you know, function declaration, function description, um, our print statement, and here we call our function. So I'm just gonna go ahead to execute this code. There you go. So we have our name. Um, this actually indicates new line, new line. So we have our name, gender, and hair color, and that's the result we have on our console. So let's talk about parameters and arguments. Basically, parameters are variables that are inputs to a function, and arguments are the values of the parameters passed into a function. Just to give an example of um, using parameters, I'll go to function params.py, and then here I have a different, different example. So just like the previous uh, function example, I've modified it a bit to accept parameters. So I have my function declaration, my function description, and then I am printing out the name as a string value, the gender and the hair color. Oh, sorry, this is supposed to be age and the age. And then notice the age is a numerical value. So that's why I'm using the percent %d. And over here, I'm passing out my variables to be called respectively. And here, just before my function call, I have assigned different variables, um, different values to different variables, such as name, gender, and age. And here, I'm passing these variables to my function. So I'm gonna clear up my console and run this code function parameters.py. There you go. So here we have the name, gender, and age, and that's how you pass parameters to functions. Okay, so let's talk about imports. So most of the time, you would like to use certain libraries or external modules, and the only way you can get to use it is by importing it into your code. So for generic imports, the module called math includes a number of useful variables and functions, and also square roots is one of you know, those functions. In order to assess the math, all you need to do is to use the import keyword. And when you simply import a module this way, it is called you know, a generic import. And we're gonna take a look um, at an example. So we also have the function imports. So in cases where we only need the square root function. You know, this works instead of having to keep typing math the square root. So over here, you can see we're importing only the square root function. In that case, um, if we're gonna use um, that module at, at, at any section of our code, we don't need to specify, um, we don't need to specify it this way, just like we have on a generic import, like math the square root. So here we just specify um, square root because that's the only function we imported out of the math module. And lastly, for the universal imports, you know, this happens if we still want all of the variables and functions in the module, but don't want 
to have to constantly type the math dot um, the math dot square root math dot seal math dot floor and math dot round. So we could just go ahead and import everything and make sure that we have all the necessary functions included in our code. And then we could just call each and every one of them like this. So let's take a look at a quick example. Um, so import, okay. So here we've imported the map module and then we're gonna go ahead to um, run this code. So it gives me the square root of 23. So let me go ahead and print Python, import of py, and there you go, the square root of 23. So what if, so just to give an example of, uh, of the function, function import, so I'm gonna do from math import square root. In that case, I really don't have to, um, you know, specify the map. So right now I'm just gonna take it away. Otherwise it's gonna throw an error to the console. So let me go ahead and run this code. There you go, we get our answer. So um, let me show you something real quick. If I do this import math module, and you want to see the list of functions that that is included in the math module, then we can write a code that uh, prints the lists of functions in this in this module. So for i in math. And then I'm going to use the dir map. Okay, let's go. Let's run this code and see what we get. So as you can see, this gives us the list of available mathematical functions you can apply anytime you need it. And let's look for square root, square root, square root. Yeah, there you go. That's the square root function. So we, ha we have built-in functions in Python as well. Um, so here, the max function takes any number of arguments and it returns the largest one. And here the mean function returns the smallest of a given series of arguments. We also have the absolute function, which returns the absolute value of a number and then we have the type function that returns the type of the data it receives as an argument. To take a look at a quick example, I have a program called buildin.py, and then I'm just gonna run all these. So we have the getMax function, it gives us the max, and it returns 22, and then we have the getMain, this should return one, Absolute value should return 54 without a negative sign. And then the print statement should return the data type as a string. Oh, let me make this type. That's a typo right there. So I'm gonna play my console and I'm gonna execute this code. Build in the py. There you go. So we have the max. The mean, I made a mistake right there. It's supposed to be mean. Sorry about that. So I'm gonna clear up my console again, and then Python build in the py. All right, so we have the max value, which is 22. We have the mean, which is one. We have the absolute value, which is 54, without a negative sign. And then the type of this uh, statement, or the string we've passed in here is actually of the class string data type. So we also have lists and dictionaries, just like you have Aries and hash maps in other programming languages. So basically, lists are data types you can use to store a collection of different pieces of information as a sequence under a single variable name. And a dictionary, on the other hand, is similar to a list, where you access values by looking up a key instead of an index. So in order to declare a list in Python, you declare a variable name, 
and set it equal to an array of items. These items could be of any data type, as long as it's enclosed within the square braces or square brackets. And then dictionaries, um, which is similar to lists, you have your variable name and set it equal to the curly braces and then key values. So your keys should be you know, a single quoted string and then you set the value after um, a single colon and then comma to specify more than one key values. And we're gonna take a look at an example. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at exam an example of a list and then we'll do a practical example after this. So I have a variable and I've assigned its value to a list of animals. And here I am printing um, each of these animals to the console by assessing its index. Next, I'm assigning, um, <clears throat> I'm assigning a value to the first index of this list. And over here, I'm using the append function to append a new word or a new value to the list. And here, we could also use the remove function to remove items from the list. So just to take a look at a quick example, I have created a list of py, and here I have um, the list of animals. And here we're printing each of these animals by assessing its index. So index and arrays do not begin with one. So by default, the first value has the index of zero and then followed by one, two, and three. In total, we have four indexes. And then here, I am overwriting the value contained within the first index. And I'm appending a new item to the list. And here I'm printing uh, the items in the list. So let's go ahead and run this code. List of py. So we have the first element, tiger, lion, zebra, elephant. And then the last, the first one, which I overwrote, remember I set the, the first index to wolf and that's what we have here. And then I appended a new item to the list, which is kangaroo. And at the end, you know, we printed um, the, the total list we have just in array format. And that's, that's what we get, we got. So basically a list doesn't have to be a fixed line. You can add items to the end of, of a list anytime you like. So we can also do slicing on lists. You know, sometimes we just want to get different sections um, of items in the list. And we have, um, we can use slicing for that. For example, um, so these are several operations we can perform on lists, like getting the lists, um, getting the length of items in the list, um, getting the first two, you know, items in the list, or the first three items, or the last three items in the list, and we we can also search for an item within a list. We can also insert a new item to a specific position, and also we can sort a list. Now, to give you an example of what that looks like. And my list to the py, I have the same code just as we have on the slides. And here I'm getting the total number of animals we have in the list. Over here, I just want to get the first two courses. We can also modify this by getting the first three courses. So I'm just going to make this two for now. And then we can set from item in a list and print, you know, the, the, the item. We can also insert an item in a specific position and we can sort um, um, items in the list. So I'm gonna go ahead to run this code, Python, list to the py, and there you go. So we have a total of five items in the list, one, two, three, four, five. Um, we sliced, we, we 
in the next um, on the next code, we we just wanted to get the first item and the second item, which is what we have here. And then this tells us the index of wolf in the list. So this tells us actually that wolf is in the fourth index, which I believe is the last index. And then here we inserted um, we inserted a, a new item to the list by specifying the index at which we want to insert, insert it. Sorry, we have snake here. And then here we're sorting the items in the list, which we have, you know, in ascending order. So dictionaries are great for things like phone books, you know, where you have, you know, pairing a name with a phone number. You know, you could use it for login pages where you can pair and email addresses with usernames and a lot more. So to take a look at an example of what lists look like, um, sorry, dictionaries. All right, so um, I have several examples and let's take a look at the first one. So the first one, I have declared an empty dictionary and then I am creating a key here, which is called Italian pasta and I'm setting its value to, um, to this numeric, uh, to this float value here. So remember, dictionaries take a uh, key value, key value pairs. So at the end of the script, I'm printing out the value of the Italian pasta. I'm gonna go ahead to run this code. There you go. So it tells us the value of the Italian pasta is 19.5. I'll comment out this example and uncomment this. So here I have several key value pairs, um, different courses and their cost codes. And here we just wanna print out a cost code for data science. If I go ahead and run this code, it tells us the cost code I could also print out the cost code for algorithms. If I run this, it gives us 104 and so on. On the next example, we're going to look at how we could remove an item from the from the from the dictionary. So I have to, um, the I have a dictionary that contains my courses and the cost codes in here. I just want to delete the the algorithm course, and then we're gonna print out uh, the rest of the items contained within the dictionary. I'll run this code, and there you go. Algorithm is gone. Next, we wanna take a look at how we can overwrite the value of a key. So I have a list of courses, I have my Process Python and I'm overwriting its value and setting it to 375 instead of 149. And at the end, I'm printing out the content of this dictionary. If I run this code, there you go. So Python is now 375. And lastly, we can also assign lists to keys within a dictionary. And the way you can access that if you want to print it is you have the variable name of the dictionary and then we assess its key, which is Python. And then this is the first index, right? And that's um, the first index. And that's what we have here. Notice, the, 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 notice that the square brackets was actually used twice. So if I go ahead and print this, there you go. We're printing the first value of the Python key. And also we can print the second value. That's, that should be the third, the third index actually. So part three, and then the last one, part four. So in this section, we're gonna talk about loops. Now, loops allow you to quickly iterate over information in Python. It helps you iterate over items or 
you know, any sequence in order to apply some kind of function to each of the items or just to list them out. You can iterate over a list, tuples, and strings in Python. So we're going to take a look at two types of loops. We have the while loops and then the for loops. So the while loop is similar to an if statement. You know, it executes the code inside of it if some condition is true. Now the difference is that the while loop will continue to execute as long as the condition is true. In other words, instead of executing if something is true, it executes while that thing is true. So we're going to take a look at an example and run this code and see how it works. So let me switch to my code editor and then I'm going to go to while loop. Comment this out. All right, so let's take a look at the first example. So we created a variable called loop condition and assign um, the value, the Boolean value true. And here we're saying, while this condition is true, keep printing, I am a while loop. And then after this, it sets the loop condition to false. So this code is gonna look at the loop condition and see that it is true. And then it's going to print this, but when the code gets to this line, it sets it to false and then it stops printing. So this is just going to print once. Let's run the code and see what happens. So I'm going to play my console and then Python keyword and while well, look the name of my file. Yep. So it prints it is just once. So let's take a look at a second example. All right, so I will declare the variable here and set its value to, to zero. And then I have my while loop keyword and my condition. So here I'm saying that while my count is less than 10, which it is because count is currently zero, print hello, I have a while loop. And then I have the count value, but notice I am doing an incrementation here. Without this code, my while loop is just going to loop forever. And so if you look to a situation where, <clears throat> where you have a memory leak, then your system starts freezing. So you always want to have um, a form of check, like an incrementation that ensures that this count value isn't going to be um, less than zero forever. So this makes sure that my count value is actually incrementing. And at some point it gets to 10 and breaks out of this loop. So let's run this code and see what happens. So I'm gonna execute the same statement. There you go. So I have hello and it counted from zero all the way to 10 because I have less than 10. But if I wanna print out 10, I could do less than or equal to and if I run this again, there it prints, it prints out 10. All right, so let's move to the third while loop example. So let's take a look at, it, at this example. So this example um, sends a message to the console and says, are you enjoying this workshop or not? And then it tells you to enter a value either yes or no. So here we're doing a check using a while loop. So if your value is not equal to Y or N, then it prints out the statement. But if, if, it is, if it is equal to Y or N, it just breaks out of the loop and you know moves on to the next um, code you wanna run. So I'm gonna clear up my console and run this file again. So, the message on the console says, are you enjoying the workshop? So I'm gonna go ahead to say, why? And it breaks out of the loop. But what if we enter something, you know, that it doesn't recognize, like M. Now it keeps saying, I didn't catch that Q. I didn't catch that, I didn't catch that, I didn't catch that, but this, it's gonna catch it. And then it breaks out of the loop. So let's take a look at example four. Here we've declared a variable and 
set x value to zero. And then we have the while loop. And here we are explicitly uh, stating a Boolean value true. And here we're printing a count and doing our incrementation here. So the count plus equal to one is just another way of doing, um, it's just another way of saying count equal to count plus one. So that's just a short form of that. And then <clears throat> here we're doing, we're checking to see if the count is greater than five. Now, if the count, if the code gets to this point and this count ever, you know, becomes greater than five, then we just want to break out of the loop. To see how that works, let's execute this code again. There you go. So it started all the way from zero, one, two, three, and then it broke when it was about to go way above five. So let's take a look at a final example. Basically, this code generates a random integer and then it allows me to guess three times. It gives me three chances to guess. So it takes my guess as an input and then it compares it with a generated random number. If it is equal to the generated random number, it prints you win. Otherwise, it prints you lose after I no longer have um, a chance. So let's execute this code. My guess, two, wrong, five, wrong, three, wrong, you lose. Let's try that again. One, I guess, seven, oops, you lose. Well, we can actually, actually print this guess out just to see. <clears throat> we can print a random number just to see what the system generated and then um, let's run it. All right, so the, the system generated nine, so it means nine is the correct answer. So I'm just gonna enter a wrong number just to see that it works and then nine, yep, you win. So that's how this program works. Now let's take a look at for loops. For loop is another way to loop over items and manipulate um, the items just like the while loop. So here we have a simple example that uses a for loop to print um, the value one to 19. So basically the range function in Python creates a sequence which can be useful when combining with the for loop statement to loop over a sequence with explicit indices. So let's take a look at an example. I'm gonna go back to my code base and then I have a for loop, the py. So first, we just wanna print out um, zero to 19. That's what this function, this um, state, this code does. So I'm gonna clear up my console, Python, for loop, the py, there you go. It prints zero all the way to 19. So let's take a look at example two. Oh, sorry. All right, so this basically um, is, a, is a program that allows a user to enter three interests of his or her choice, and then it stores um, these interests into this array. So here you can see it takes the input value and then it stores, it appends it to this array, and finally it prints the num um, the content of the array or the list. So let's run this code again. Okay, interest, computer, computers, interest, music, interest, um, there you go. So finally, it prints the, the number of interests I just entered. So next, 
we're going to take a look at example three. You can also use for loops to loop to um, characters to print you know, a list of characters. And that's what this program does. So if I clear up my console and execute this code, there you go, we have Python. Uh, so let's take a look at example four. Basically, I'm trying to manipulate a string using a for loop. So I'm saying for each character in this statement, if we ever find an or or an R, we want to replace that part of the code of the statement with X and then continue printing it on the same line. Otherwise, we just want to keep printing the characters still on the same line. So let's run this code and see what happens. Unfold loop. There you go. So it replaced the O's and the R's with X. So the next example, which is the last example, we could also use, oh, that was the second to last example. Example five, we can use for loop to look over the items in the list. So this code right here prints out the items contained within the list using the for loop. So let's run that. So we'll do Python for loop the py, and there you go. It gives us the list of items within this list. And the final example, we can also use for loops for dictionaries where we can print the key and the value of that dictionary. So here I have my dictionary and I have my A, B, C as my keys and the values is apple, berry, and cherry. And here I'm saying for every key in this dictionary, print the key followed by the, the value so here I have my dictionary, and then I am assessing its index by putting its key inside the square brackets. All right, so run the code. There you go. So I have my key and a value printed. So now let's talk about file input and output. Reading and writing information to and from a file doesn't really require importation statements in your Python script. Now, if you want to read information from a file on your computer or write an information to another file, this process is called the file IO. So the file input and output. So we're going to take a look at an example of how we could write to a file and also read what we wrote to a file. I'm going to switch to my code base and then file.py. So, the, so let's take a look at the first example. We want to write to a file. I have the collective variable called my list and I've assigned a list of courses to my variable. On the next line, I am opening the file with the open method and then I am passing the name of the file, the name I want to call the file as a first argument and then what operation I want to perform on a file, which is the right operation. And after that, I want to loop through the items contained in my list and then write each of these items to my file. So here I have the f.write and then it writes each of these items on a new line. So this is the way I appended a new line to it. And so right here, you can notice that I'm closing the, fi closing the file, which is always a good practice just to ensure that our data has been persisted to the disk. So I'm gonna go ahead to run this code. I'll clear my console into Python file.py. All right, so we have no output, but if you take a look at the left side of my screen, you would see the output of text. And if I click on this, you're gonna see the content of our list. On the next example, now we want to read the content of the output.txt file. So here I've declared my variable 
And then I've opened the file because I know its location. So this is actually the file part. And next, I am passing the read operation as a second argument to this function. Next, I want to read the file. So I do my file dot read with a read function. And finally, I just want to close my file, which is a good practice. I'll run this code and there you go. It reads the content of our file and just flashes it to the screen. Look at example three. Now, what if I just want to read one line? Let's say the first line of a text file. So over here, I have a text file called text.csd and it contains three lines of sentences. So the print my file, the read line actually returns the first line of um, sentence within that file. And at the end, I'm closing my file. So let's run this code and see the result. So here, it only returns the first line. And if you check here, you can see that's the first line it printed to the console. And what if I want to print the next line? I could repeat this print statement over and over again, and then it's going to give me all the lines within the program. I mean, this is kind of a naive way to do this. There are other better ways you could print um, all the content of a file. So let me go ahead to run this code. There you go. We have all the lines as expected. Cool. All right. So example four, we want to write and read from the file. So here I have opened a file called text.txt. And then I'm passing the write flag because I'm going to write to this file. And next, um, I've opened a, a same text of txt file and I'm going to read from the same file. So here I'm writing the statement to the file, closing it, and then I am reading the content of the file. And finally, I'm closing the same file. Now let's run this code, see what we get. So because I have the text of txt file, it has overwritten the content of the file and replaced it with this statement here. So that is how you do file manipulations in Python. Now let's talk about Python Anaconda. Anaconda is a Python and R distribution for data science. It aims to provide everything you need, you know, Python-wise for data science tasks. Anaconda also is a set of binaries that includes Skippy, NumPy, Pandas, along with all their dependencies. So what are the benefits you could get from using Anaconda? Well, Anaconda is the world's most popular data science platform for data scientists and IT professionals. So basically, Anaconda is free and open source. It has more than 1,500, it has more than 1,500 Python and R data science packages. Anaconda also simplifies package management and deployment. It also has tools to easily collect data from sources using machine learning and AI. You could also use Anaconda to create an environment that is easily manageable for deploying any project. Anaconda also is the industry standard for developing, testing, and training on a single machine. Anaconda has good community support and you can ask your questions there and get help whenever you need it. So we also have Conda, which is used to install packages, which may contain software written in any language. It can install Python packages as well as the Python interpreter directly. So basically Conda has the ability to create isolated environments that can contain different versions of Python. And these include um, other libraries such as C, C++, and R. Well, Condor can you know, be extremely useful when working with data science tools as different tools may contain conflicting requirements which could prevent them 
from being installed into a single environment. Well, in order to get started with Anaconda and check out you know, what it is, you could use the link to download Anaconda, get it installed, and play around it. Well, you've come this far, and thank you for watching this tutorial. And if you need help with anything, you could always send us an email at hpcteam at nmsu.edu and would be readily available to assist you. Thank you. <laughs>